You know how a, a Jewish wedding takes place? It's uh, been for centuries and centuries. Uh, the first stage is they sign a contract, a ketubah. And then the, either the bridegroom or the father of the bridegroom pays a dowry to the bride. So that's happened for us, right? When we accepted Yeshua, the dowry that was paid was his blood. And now the next step is where you found Miriam and Yosef in the betrothal stage. That's where we are right now. We're betrothed. We're as good as married. And that's where the parable of the virgins comes in. We have to keep ourselves chaste and prepared for his coming because he's going to come at any time. And in the Jewish ceremony, the bridegroom didn't know when he was going to come. But the father, when the father was ready and the house was prepared, the father would send the bridegroom with an entourage and a shofar blessed. And then they would consummate the marriage through a feast, a wedding feast. Sound familiar? That's all we're waiting on, man. It's as good as done. Signed, sealed, and delivered. A couple of quickie announcements, if you don't mind. Um, I just want to tell you, when I, when I first wrote that book, Don't Die in Your Sins, I, I didn't take it all that seriously. I thought it was going to be used to help you, to help the people of Beth Yeshua, maybe if they had a, a family member, a friend that they just couldn't get to, and I thought it would be something that they could hand to them and say, just please read this. So I thought 300 books, really, honestly, I, I'm, you know me, I'm very transparent. That's what I thought, but I was okay with that because even one soul is, is worth writing something, right? I mean, everybody agrees with that. But so, so far, we've, we have 48,000 English versions distributed, which is a big number. Um, the average person that writes a book um, maybe 500,000 copies in the first month and it's over. I mean, I'm not well known. You know, I'm not. I'm a nobody. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not an influencer. Nobody knows me. So for the book to, to be distributed, and we have 11,000, 12, 12,000 Spanish versions. So we have 60,000 books, 50,000 being printed, and we still have yet to see the book in Hebrew, which should be available any day now. Telugu. Swahili and Ukrainian and Russian. It's ridiculous. It's, 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 it's nuts. It's ridiculous because a person like me couldn't pull this off. You know, what am I going to do? Stand on the corner and hand out 100,000 bucks? Well, God's doing this work. He, he, I'm, he, there's no question about it. If you knew me like I know me, God's doing this work. In fact, um, I think we have a couple of pictures, right? There's something going on in Ecuador with a guy that watches. I mean, restaurants and judges and lawyers are, are asking for more and more books so they can hand them out um, at their places. Um, no mueras en tus pecados. How did I do? Yeah, it's happening. I mean, he needs more and more, more and more, more and more, more and more books, more and more books. It's a little, it's a little revival going on in, in Ecuador. You see, not to, not to be difficult towards Catholicism, but American Catholicism. And Catholicism in Spanish-speaking countries are so different. Catholicism over there is, is very hardcore and it's very complicated. And they're reading this book, and they're just being set free, and they're getting saved, and it's nuts. Because I, I could never do that. You and I couldn't just... Yeah. Um, also, um, I'm, I'll be... Well, the Lord will be baptizing nine people this afternoon, which is very special, you know? Some places don't get to baptize much. We're constantly baptizing. Um, where's that other picture? Uh, Tommy, I think you grabbed a bunch of Spanish. Yeah, so Tommy and David, you have a friend, uh, Bloodworth, right? The guy who owns CL, and of course a lot of his, his workers are Spanish-speaking. So look at that. They're all got, he got a bunch of books, and he got them all the books, and they're going to look at them, and I think it's fantastic, you know? I couldn't pull that off. I don't speak the lingo. So that's really cool, too. Um, 
Also, last but not least, I did a DNA test, and you know what I found? You're not going to believe it. God's my father. <laughs> and if you're born again, don't bother spending the money on the test because you'll find out the same result. Isn't it great to be free in a world that is so uptight and so cupcakeish, and so, so, you know, offend I'm offended. I'm so offended. Right. But you'll pick up your cross and deny yourself, and you get offended over every little thing that's said. Stop it, man. If anybody should have been offended, it should have been Yeshua. And he went for it, didn't he? All right, so this is going to be a little bit of a clinic, I think. Um, in the body of Messiah, there seems, and I'm only saying what I've seen in, in 35 years now. Is that me or is that you? Who's doing it? You know I have ADD. Stop it. <laughs> um, 35 years, you know, I'm, I'm self-taught. I spent a lot of time with God and the Holy Spirit. I wasn't formally trained, but there seems to be a great conflict between law and grace. Huge. Um, I see it all the time. C Christian theology, for the most part, this is what Christian theology says, that the purpose of the law is to reveal sin, to convict and condemn transgressors. I get this right out of the interpretations, right out of the theological interpretations. It can never impart righteousness. The penalty of the broken law is death. In his death, Yeshua paid the penalty of the law which men had broken. In other words, we are saved by grace through faith. The keeping of the law cannot save anybody. In fact, those who claim righteousness on the basis of their keeping the law, listen to me, some of you. Listen to me really carefully. Those who claim righteousness on the basis of their keeping the law only think they're keeping the law. This was one of Yeshua's main points in the only sermon he gave, known as the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, I, personally, just so you know where I stand, am in total agreement with that theology. What a lot of people just don't realize is there's compartmentalism in our walk. You know, first you're saved. You can't be discipled if you're not saved. That's the starting point. For some people, that's the end point. But it's, biblically speaking, it's just the starting point. Then you go through a phase called sanctification. And then when that's finished, there's glorification. So when you read the letters, you read the Bible, you've got to know what compartment are they talking about. I mean, I'm sure you guys have written letters. Did you guys ever write a letter and go, now chapter 3, sentence 16? No, it was put there by men, nothing wrong with it, for teaching purposes. But you must read a whole letter. Listen to me. You are hermeneutically out of your mind if you take just a verse from a letter. There is no way on God's green earth you're going to interpret it according to the way God wants you to interpret it. It's not possible. If you see a guy open up his Bible in a place like this and read one verse and then close his Bible... And then say this, which is very arrogant. Lord, open up their ears and their hearts to hear what the Spirit is saying. First of all, who said the Spirit is speaking through you? That's a big assumption. Secondly, you're now going to talk for 30, 40 minutes on a verse taken out of context. And that's why we're, we're really not that well schooled. We're not that well trained. We have our, you know, oh, my favorite verse, your favorite verse. Philippians, who are the Philippians? Where was it located? When was the letter written? Who wrote it? What was going on in Philippi when it was written? Where was the writer when he wrote it? What was the purpose overall in the letter? Oh, wow. That's deep. It's not really that deep. It doesn't take a long time to figure out, does not So the law, that's what the purpose was. The, listen, I feel bad for the children of Israel. God gave them laws to walk out that they just couldn't. They couldn't do it 100%. Nobody can. 
when the rich young ruler came to Yeshua and said, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to inherit? Great question. And he said, well, you know what the law says. And he goes, I've done these since I'm a, you know, a young boy, meaning I've done all the law. Again, those who think they're doing all the law perfectly are sadly mistaken. They're deceived. Self-deception. Totally deceived. So you know what? This is a fact. You can inherit eternal life if you obey the law perfectly. You can. Give it a shot. I'm sure you have. It leads you to a place of desperation. It leads you to this place where you fall on your face and go, Lord, why do I do the things I don't want to do? And why don't I do the things I know I should do? Who will save me? By the way, Paul said that about seven years into his salvation. He didn't say that prior to being saved. And I think he has a pretty darn good resume. What do you think? I mean, you know when you're walking good, you, you feel solid, you feel holy, and you know why? Because you're not around anybody. It's easy to get along with yourself, right? Like I was home alone for a week and everything was grandiose. I felt like I didn't even sin. I felt like I'd walk on water. And then Lily came home and it was over. <laughs> if you're alone, it's, you could feel that way, but, and it's not even totally easy being around, you know, your family who you love. How about people who you can't stand? And the Bible I read says, love your enemies. So how are you doing with the law? By the same token, here's the other side of it. We're not going to stop there because it shouldn't stop there. By the same token, some in the Christian world, and I say some, I didn't say Christianity teaches, but I know the some, they teach that when a sinner receives Yeshua as Messiah or Jesus Christ as Savior, the law has nothing more to say to them. You guys have been Christian. I, I was never really Christian. You know, I, I met the Lord. You guys were Christian for a long time. Does anybody, can anybody attest to that? Has, have you ever heard that? You're looking at me like a deer in the headlights. Help me out. You know why I need to help me out? Because if you stand there like a yutz and you don't move, I think I'm talking to a painting and I think I need mental health. I got to know because these are things I talk to people. I read these things and I want to know if they're true. I talk to pastors all the time. I say, in the, in the Methodist world, you guys in the Baptist world, I want to know. I want to know what they believe. I want to know what they do. I want to know why they do it. Through the death of his substitute, the person has a substitute dying for them, a Zobach, that's Yeshua. He has died to the law. You'll see this in some letters. But if you're not careful, doesn't Satan twist? Arvon, iniquity, you know what that means? To twist. Did God really say he just twists it. He doesn't make it obvious because then we wouldn't be deceived. For deception to accomplish its goal, it's got to be really good. It's got to be very deceiving. And that's the way deception works. The Apostle Paul dealt with the potential grace abusers when he asked, and I quote, therefore, Shall we sin more so grace can abound more? And that question is rhetorical. And he answers, heaven forbid. The RGV, the Rabbi Greg version, are you out your mind? Like, why did he even have to ask that? Have you lost your mind? Should we sin more? Should we be more lawless? Should we hurt more people? Should we devastate and destroy and, re and cause havoc so that grace can abound more? <sighs> wow. Who would think that? Who would think that? So let me give you one example. I don't want to belabor it. I don't want to keep you here forever. I really don't. Romans 10.4. I just did a split screen. Here's the KJV, the King James Version. Here's the complete Jewish Bible. By the way, I really question whether King James was born again. But when you're the king and you hire interpreters, you do what you're told, especially when you paid well. 
It says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The complete Jewish Bible says, for the goal at which the Torah, which is synonymous. By the way, when you see Torah, that's synonymous with law. Law and Torah, Torah law. And that is also synonymous with Torah means God's teachings. So some people's flesh has a hard time with law. They're like, oh, I don't like that. Okay, teachings, does that work for you? God's teachings, God's Torah, God's law, it's all the same word. It aims is the Messiah who offers righteousness to everyone who trusts. So I believe an error was made here, a serious error. One word changes everything. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. And that changes everything, right? That's the Jehovah Witness Bible, the New World Translation. So you gotta be a little careful. Rabbi, you uptight? No, not at all, not even close. I'm just trying to avoid being duped. I believe there was an error made here and by a lot of New Testament English translations of this text, rendering the word Greek telos as end and not goal. Because this implies, the KJV implies termination of the law, which is often understood to mean that the law has been abolished, right? We're saved by grace, the law is nailed. We're not under the law, we're under grace. You've, you've seen this being said, you've seen it in the Bible, but you gotta be careful about taking it out of context. You know, it's like, the movie was good, and they throw that up in the critique, except for the profanity, that you know, you gotta read the comma after the comma, it's very important. Attention to, attention to and faith in Messiah is Torah's goal with salvation in mind. Justification, that compartment. When it comes to salvation, there's no way around it. Don't mess with Golgotha. Do not mess with the cross. Don't you dare add to it. Don't you dare take away from it. That is the only way. That is it, and there's nothing to discuss. It's fundamental, nothing to discuss, okay? But once that goal is achieved, meaning once you're saved, now we gotta move on. It's time to grow up, you know? Get off the milk. It's time to move on. So once that goal is achieved, I'm born again. The logical, I'm saying logical result is to observe the law out of a genuine faith as opposed to a legalistic observance. Do you follow? If you're born again, you should delight. You should, you should delight to be obedient to a God who's now your father and who thinks the world of you. What I've told this to my kids when they were young. Listen, nothing I'm going to say is going to be said to hurt you. Nothing. Everything I say, every directive I give you is going to be to bless you. So we could do this the easy way or the hard way. Your choice. If me, who is basically evil, what does that mean? I still sin. If I could want so much good and blessing and protection and peace and prosperity for my children, how much more would God want for us, but the flesh is ugly. The flesh can't do nothing right. It can't even be controlled. You can't control it. You can't harness it. It, it wants to have its fling. You got to kill it. You got to crucify it. You got to sacrifice it. Burn, baby, burn. That's the only way. And the spirit can't do nothing wrong. It's not possible. The spirit in you. So what's, what's, the, what's the goal? Reduce the flesh. Increase the spirit. What's a legalistic, adver legalistic observance? It's very important I share this with you because some of you are, I'm sure, family members because all of a sudden you're in the messianic movement. You're a legalist. First of all, 
Obeying God's laws is not being a legalist, it's being a goddess. What? How could that be bad? How could it be bad walking in the ways of God? That, it, 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 I just think it's insanity. But there's a guy, a very well-known 20th century English theologian, C.E.B. Cranfield, in his work in 1964 entitled St. Paul and the Law. This is what he said. I can't, I can't improve on what he said. Legalism is not what we do, but the reason or motivation behind why we are doing it. You could be here legalistically. You can go to the prison legalistically. You can do all kinds of things for God legalistically as opposed to delighting and desiring to do it. That's not what he said. That's what I said. The spirit, this is what he said. The spirit of legalism wants a person to believe that they are in some way superior to others due to a circumstance like a secret revelation or a powerful testimony. People say, Rabbi, your, your testimony is so unbelievable. You got saved on Yom Kippur in Israel on Mount Tabor. That's because I was so flippin' lost that I needed something big. It's not because I'm special. The testimony of God is special. Or an obedience to a particular law. These spirits, the spirit of legalism, is promoted by three things. Pride, fear, and insecurity. Pride, fear, and insecurity. And it leads to elitism. You think because you have a special testimony or you got some secret revelation that God told you but nobody else. Or you're more obedient. So all of a sudden you're the elite. The Catholics don't know nothing because they don't know the Bible. And the Methodists and the Presbyterians, they're kind of lost because they believe in replacement theology and the word of God is inerrant. The Baptists, they're losing it too. The Charismatics, but now I'm in the Messianic world and now I've arrived. I'm complete. Not even close. I'm sorry. I love you. But you're a legend in your own mind. You, if, you think, if you think something special about yourself, you don't know the God I know. Because every great man and woman of God that I know over the centuries, as they got closer to God, they felt more ugly in their own eyes. Doesn't mean you shouldn't beat yourself up. It's just get off the pedestal. This ain't the Olympics. Only Yeshua got the gold medal. You don't even get bronze. So the conflict between law and grace exists. It does, guys. I don't want it to exist here. That's why I'm sharing this. One person says, quote, salvation is by grace and grace alone. Another person counters and says, yeah, but this leads to lawlessness. God's righteous standard is that the law must be upheld. Guys, I got a newsflash for you. God has always been full of grace. Read Psalm 116. Always. The deliverance of the children of Israel? You don't think that was an act of crazy grace? And people have always been saved by faith. The last time I read in Genesis 15, 6, it says Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. This isn't new. It's renewed. When you see a new moon, you don't go, oh, that's a totally different moon. No, it's renewed. It's the same old moon. Renewed. The same God who gave the law also gave Yeshua. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him, they will not perish, but have life everlasting. His grace was demonstrated through the law by providing the sacrificial system. He provided a system to cover sin that went on for centuries. I mean, animals, innocent animals dying on behalf of my sin? That's an act of crazy grace. So, Rabbi, is it law or is it grace? Look at Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12 talks about main characters during the tribulation. It says, the dragon, the devil, was infuriated 
over the woman. Who is the woman? Good. Israel. And went off to fight the rest of her children. Those who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. Why was he so infuriated? Because he failed to destroy the Messiah. Look at Revelation 12. I'm just going to read it to you. Forgive me. I didn't put it in there, but I think it's important. It says its tail, the dragon's tail, swept a third of the stars out of heaven and threw them down to earth. A possible reference to the war in heaven, which takes place in the middle of the Revelation and which results in fallen angels being cast from heaven to earth. Then it said, it stood in front, of the, in front of the woman about to give birth so that it might devour the child the moment it was born. Can you imagine? That was fulfilled by Herod the Great. He tried to kill Yeshua when he came out of the womb. Listen, Yeshua was crucified when he was born, man. Born to die. No other choice. It says in verse 5, she gave birth to the son. Yes, Israel birthed Yeshua. Salvation is of the Jews. I don't care how you slice and dice it. That's John 4, 22. You got a problem with that? You got a problem with the Gospels. You got a problem with that? You got a problem with what Yeshua said. You got a problem with that? You got a problem with the Bible. Get lost. Stop jerking around. Just take the word for what it is and believe it. She gave birth to a son, a male child, the one who will rule all the nations with a staff of iron. So it jumps from his birth to his ascension. Now, He's infuriated because he failed. He's been very angry for a very long time. You know what his problem is? He's got irritable Baal syndrome. <laughs> it's miserable. Don't fall prey to it. No cure. So he's failed to destroy the Messiah, Revelation 12, 4 through 5. His mother Israel, the frustrated dragon, wages war on the rest of her offspring. He hates the Jews. People ask me, why do people hate the Jews? People don't hate the Jews. Satan hates the Jews. He just works through people to do his bidding. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. It's a spiritual thing. There's 8 billion people in the world. There's 14 million Jews, minuscule, in a land with no oil, a miserable little nothing land the size of New Jersey. How could they be hated through the centuries by everybody? People don't even know why they hate them. It's a spirit. You don't fight against flesh and blood. You fight against principalities and powers in heavenly places. It's been a fight with Satan and God from the beginning of time from the garden. And God's going to finish the fight very soon. So it says that he was in frustrated, infuriated, with her offspring. And this, it says, those who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. I'll be a son of a gun. You could have both. You could have both. Set. So I can have Yeshua. I can be saved by grace and still obey the law. So it's not law. Law is good. It says it's holy, just, and good. Romans 7, 12. You're not going to tell me that God's laws are bad. Like the don't steal, the don't lie. That's good stuff, man. On your mother and father, it's good, right? The grace of God is good. Why are you letting something good compete with something good? That's spiritual insanity. They don't compete. They're, they're, they're locked, man. They're interdependent. You can't have one without the other. Look at James 2.18. Someone will say that you have faith and I have actions. Again, trying to separate them like grace and truth or grace and law. James says, show me this faith of yours without the actions. Go ahead. Let's have a symposium on faith. Tell me everything you know about faith. And I'll show you mine by my actions. I'm not going to quote scripture. Baby, I'm going to live it. The key word is show. Show. Stop talking. Stop talking. God, stop talking. As one of my southern friends once said, there's somebody, that talk, they talk so much, they'll talk the horns off a billy goat. I mean, talk, talk radio. You're listening. Talk, listen on the internet, look, listening, reading. Look, do something. Do something. 
Faith is invisible. It's only seen via works. The objecta in James is an objecta. It's 108 verses, 54 commands, and the objecta argues that faith and works are separable. You can separate them. James says, no, you can't. Faith cannot save without works. Why? Because real faith produces real works, and real works evidence real faith. It just happens. If you're born again, you don't have to do a checklist. Exodus 19. It's in you, man. It's in you. It's part of you. Once we are saved, God desires to glorify himself. Remember when Yeshua said, do your good works so that the lost can see it and maybe glorify your Father in heaven. Hello? That was Yeshua's thing, man. You didn't see him stroking his beard and turning pages in the Talmud. He took it to the streets. God desires to glorify himself through our good works. Therefore, good works follow salvation. They do not precede it. We must always remember the law was given to a redeemed people. Exodus 12, they're redeemed. The law doesn't come till Exodus 19. Let's just give a scenario here. Let's say the children of Israel, with their little kippas and their tzitzits and doing everything they were supposed to do. Let's say they were obeying the law 100%. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Theologian. What do they do about their past sins? How could my righteousness today pay for my sins yesterday? The answer is it can't. It's not possible even if the children could uphold the law they still had past sins the quintessential matthew 5 17 through 18 this is yeshua speaking not me that's why it's qu quotations don't think that i have come to abolish the torah or the law or the prophets or the teachings whatever you like i have come not to abolish but to complete Yes, indeed, exclamation point. I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yud or a stroke. The yud is the, the smallest letter in Hebrew, and the stroke is how to pronounce it. Will pass from the Torah or the law, not until everything that must happen has happened. Most revolutionary leaders sever all ties with the past, you know, you got, Rabbi, you're a dinosaur. First of all, if you think I'm a dinosaur, you need glasses, but that's another thing. They sever all ties with the past, and they reject the traditional existing order. I'm a traditionalist. I'm not old school. I'm, I'm, what's, all, what's this business about old school? The, I'm a traditionalist. I'm traditional. I don't want to, I don't want to change the message. If you give the message, it has the potential to change us. I'm not going to add to it. The Bible says if you add to it, you add the curses upon yourself. I'm not going to take away from it. It says if you take away from it, you'll have your name removed from the book of life. Uh-uh. I'm giving it straight up, man. But Yeshua was a traditionalist. He upheld the law of Moses and insisted that it must be fulfilled. Nothing in Scripture, not even the smallest stroke is insignificant. The law is the system of legislation that God gave to the children of Israel through Moses' hand. The Sermon on the Mount not only upholds the law and the prophets, but it amplifies them and develops their deeper meaning. We are not saved by works, but by grace. By the same token, if we truly love the Lord, we would not only have a desire to walk in His ways, We'd be delighted to. That's why you must be born again. You must be born again. There's no way around it. Matthew 5, 19. So whoever disobeys the least of these commandments and has the audacity to teach others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In returning to the sermon, 
we notice that Yeshua anticipated, at least I believe this, a natural tendency to relax God's commands. You know who will tell you, relax, Satan. Don't take it so seriously. Man, you're a little uptight. Why don't you relax? Because they are of such a supernatural nature, people tend to explain them away. I, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You should be a recovering sinner. You're still the same after you got saved? What did salvation do to you? Give you a pass, you know, don't go to jail card, you play Monopoly? Well, they rationalize their meaning. Well, he didn't really mean that. What? It's pretty straightforward. He, he spoke in less than three syllables. He, he didn't speak to the intelligentsia. You're rationalizing what he said? Why? You're not comfortable with what he said? But whoever disobeys the least of God's commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. The wonder for me is that such people are, are permitted in the kingdom at all. But thankfully, I'm not God because I might not have permitted you in. In fact, I'm being honest with you. There's a couple I would have absolutely kept out. But entrance into the kingdom of heaven is by repentance and being immersed into Yeshua for forgiveness of one's sins. Compartmentalized. Salvation. Justification. A person's position in the kingdom is determined by his obedience and faithfulness while on earth. In other words, the person who obeys the laws of the kingdom shall be called great. Look, some of you uh, go to sports events it's fine it's entertainment don't make it more than that don't cry because your team lost first of all you don't own the team in a lot of ways they own you but go have fun knock yourself out when my first son was young i was training a guy who was a billionaire in orman he had tickets first row first row orlando magic i played a lot of basketball as young he never went and one day he just said to me hey you want my my tickets I knew they had to be good. He's a billionaire. The owner, Rick DeVos, sat behind me. We went all the time, me and Jay, right? I was there. I met Puffy. You met Puffy? Yeah. I got a picture with Puffy. I took you? Yeah. What happened to Jeremy? He was there. We had more than two tickets? Yes, we all went. He was nothing. They didn't charge him a ticket. He was a little... What do you mean he was nothing? How dare you talk that way about our son? <laughs> Woman, it's gotten into you. Oh, my kids are nothing. They mean nothing to me. Um, but let me tell you what happens when you get spoiled. If a, if a guy called me, I remember this guy, Scott, he called me. He said, hey, I got tickets for the magic. Would you like to go? It was, it was, I said, where are the seats? You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be in the nosebleeds in the kingdom of heaven. You know, I've been, you've been, you, 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 some, they have these concerts now. We used to go to concerts all the time, but we went to small venues in Greenwich Village. 50 people, 100 people. Now, now people go to stadiums and they spend $300 a ticket to stadium. I mean, you don't know if it's Billy Joel or Diana Ross up there. You're so far away. <laughs> in other words, all believers will have eternal life. But not all will enjoy to the same extent their rewards. Their rewards. Just so you know, um, a guy by the name of Roy Blizzard and David Biven wrote a book called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. Gentiles, Christians, they did an incredible job. On page 154 of that book, they said, abolish and fulfill were rabbinic Words of rabbinic augmentation, meaning if you were a first century Jew and you used those terms, fulfill and abolish, they knew exactly what you were saying. To abolish means to in incorrectly interpret. And to fill means to correctly interpret. So what Jesus was saying to a very Jewish audience, 
In fact, they were all Jews in a Jewish place called Israel. And the king of Israel, well, the king of the Jews is speaking, and he said, you guys are, incre- you guys are jerking around. You're jerking around. You're seeing how much of the world you can hold on to and still hold on to the kingdom. He said, now I'm going to correctly interpret it. doesn't mean to abolish. You can't abolish the law. What are you going to do? Abolish thou shalt not murder? Abolish thou shalt not commit adultery? Abolish thou shalt not. How are you going to do that? It can't be done. Those are forever, man. You can't mess with that. So what do we do? God, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament to me is God gave rules and laws and teachings and to follow, but didn't give the power to walk it out. They didn't have access to the Holy Spirit. You know how frustrating that is? That's like telling you to do something but not giving you the ability or the resources to accomplish its goal. You're blessed that you're on this side of the cross, dude. Crazy blessed. Do do you understand the access of God's spirit in you, guiding you, directing you, speaking to you? It's unheard of. It's unheard of. They had to run to Moses. Could we? Is this okay? What? Frustrating. But Jeremiah made a promise. It's called the New Covenant, Jeremiah 31. He said, listen, the days are coming, meaning it's something prophetic, and that's why he's a prophet. Says Adonai, prophets speak for the Lord. They don't speak on their own. You got a lot of prophets running around today working for nonprofit organizations. (laughs) Says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant, there it is. You're a new covenant believer. You're not a New Testament believer. You're a New Testament believer, but you also believe in the Old Testament, hopefully. But you are under the new covenant. You're not under the Mosaic covenant. You are a new covenant believer. That's how the Bible describes you. And he says, one day, somewhere in the future, I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm going to renew the covenant I made. Meaning, it's not brand new. It's renewed. I'm going to take that Mosaic covenant, and I'm going to renew it. How are you going to do that? What, are you going to tell us again? Are you going to put it on another stone? T- oh, I'm going to do something way better than that. No, no, I'm, not, I'm just going to hand you a rule book. Watch what I'm going to do under this new covenant. First of all, it's made with the house of Israel and Judah. So if you're not grafted in, you're screwed. You don't get the promises and not have to walk with the responsibility, Sorry. That's the new America, you know? I'll come here, I take, I'm giving nothing. Get the heck out. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers. What covenant did he make with their fathers? When I took them by the hand and I led them out of Egypt, I led them out of slavery, I led them out of bondage, I delivered them, I redeemed them with a strong arm. It wasn't some covert black ops. I did it right in front of Pharaoh and his army. He said, they're mine, I'm taking them, and guess what? You're not going to do a flipping thing about it. And I brought them out of the land of Egypt because they, for their part, violated my covenant. They didn't do their part. They didn't obey the Mosaic covenant. Even though I, for my part, was a husband to them. I cared for them. I protected them like the apple of my eye. Every promise I made to them, I fulfilled For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Here it goes. This is what you're under. I'll put my law within them. How could anybody in their right mind as a Christian, as a new covenant believer, say he abolished it when he's saying, I'm going to put it inside you? How do you reconcile that? Well, one day I'm going to put it inside you, but it's abolished. Do you hear yourself? Do do they hear what they're saying? They're smarter than me. They went to cemetery. I mean seminary. (laughs) I'll put it within. I'll write it on. And I will be very personal. They will know me as their God. We we are going to have intimacy. 
they're going to know me so well that they're going to actually be able to call me Abba Father. This is crazy, guys. All right, we're coming to the home stretch. The Torah needed to get on the inside of us. It wasn't working on the outside. Drive on I-75. You see speed limits? How are they doing? It needed to be placed on our heart, which is the center of our total person. You know, you know when you say, oh, my kids have my heart, or they're always on my heart. This is the idea. With the ways of God written on our heart, we would have an inward desire to walk them out. Attention to and faith in Messiah is Torah's goal. Not to end Torah per se, but to make the ways of God alive and kicking on the inside of us. The laws show us what God wants, holiness, and grace gives us the desire and the power to do so. Grace isn't just for salvation. It gives us the power. The power of God is God's grace. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. Those poor children of Israel didn't get it. Last verse, two verses, Ezekiel said it this way, another major prophet. I will give you a new heart. This is God speaking, not Ezekiel. He doesn't have the power to do that, nor do I, nor do you. And I'll put a new spirit inside you. What a, they must have been like, what are you talking about? What are you talking? I don't know what you're talking about. I will take away your stony heart of your flesh, your hard-heartedness, your rebellious ways. You're flying off the handle because some chinch bugs got in your grass, lunatic. I will put my spirit inside you and cause you to live by my laws, respect my rulings, and obey them. I'm going to cause you, he says, to live by my laws. It almost seems like he's, he's forcing but his laws are ways of pleasantness, peace, and protection. What he's forcing on us is blessing. What he's forcing on us is protection. What he's forcing on us is prosperity. What he's forcing on us is good mental health. What he's forcing on us is for us to be a blessing to others so we can feel good about ourselves. He's forcing a great purpose on us so we don't have to be depressed and down and out. That's what he's forcing. Look at the word cause. In the Hebrew, asah means to do. In other words, we'll just do it. So it looks like God came up with the slogan to just do it some 2,500 years before Nike did. <laughs> See, listen to me. L listen to me. This takes sometimes years to, to figure out. It shouldn't. But if you cause yourself to do it, if some of you think, no, I'm holy, I'm disciplined. Listen, if you cause yourself to do it, then you get the glory. Oh, well, I'm doing this, and this is my ministry, and I, you're getting the glory. Now, you say you don't want the glory, but you're sure talking like you do. And this doesn't work for me. It's all about him. Then stop talking about yourself. Start talking about him. I have found, and this has taken me 35 years, I think I'm just scratching the surface, guys. I'm sorry. I'm a slow learner. I have found that surrendering my life and letting God, allowing God to live his life through me as opposed to me trying to live my life for him. I wrote a book, A Life for God. I would change it. It's far superior because in every case, if I surrender, completely surrender, and he lives his life through me, in every case, he gets the glory, and I'm more chill. We have way too many uptight believers who aren't even happy. They need the world to be happy. God, yeah, it's okay, but the game, the party, the vacation, that's what makes me happy. And then I go on that, and I go, thank you, God. But what if you don't have that? Or what if all hell breaks loose? Is it still thank you, God? Or well, he's not such a great God after all. 
So we come to the conclusion. Yeah, some of you like coming here for the first time. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> this I like, the conclusion. Yes. God, if anybody could talk the horns off of Billy Goat, it's that guy. <laughs> so we come to the conclusion that the problem with the law is not its use, it's abuse. The law is not faulty, it's fault finding. The laws of God were given to a redeemed people and was never meant to save souls. We don't have to choose between the grace of God and the truth of God. For all grace without truth is deceptive and all truth without grace is destructive. In reality, we should walk in the fullness of God's grace and the fullness of God's truth. We live in a religious world today where God's love is overemphasized while his righteousness is played down. The Bible says, for the Torah was given through Moshe. Grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. Yeshua did not come to judge the world but to save those who are unworthy and who could not save themselves. This, my friends, is grace. There should be no conflict between grace and the law, properly understood. Yeshua fulfilled the law on our behalf and offers the power of the Holy Spirit who motivates a regenerated heart to live in obedience to him. I feel for you if you've been raised in the faith and one day you gave your heart to the Lord and there was no real change. I feel for you. What happened? What, what, what didn't happen? I mean, for me, it's been, a, it's been a great change. Far from finished, but a great change. I'm telling you, a great change. Bernadette met me at 1985. I got saved in 1989. Ask her, ask her what it was like. And I, everybody in the Bible who got saved had a great change. Everybody, that's, all I, that's, that's what I see. And people come far and wide to hear some great testimony about somebody who was like a hitman for the mafia, and now he's got a homeless ministry or something. That's a great change. How come there's been no great change for you, sweet pea? How come the change has been that you're just more judgmental and critical? and more difficult to be around, more miserable. Great change since I've been born. It's been a great change since I've been born. Great change, y'all, since I've been born. Been a great change since I've been born. Things that I used to do, I don't do no more. Things that I used to do, I don't do no more. Things that I used to do, uh, I don't do no more. <laughs> been a great change since I, been a great change since I, been a great change since I, been born to do, to do, do. <laughs> and just as a side note, I tried to change before I met the Lord failed. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't. God did it. God did it. And he continues to do it. And when I say all the glory goes to God, I'm not saying that to impress you. And that is not religious rhetoric. I'm saying that because I know that to be true. Not only did grace come through Yeshua, but truth came through him as well. He said, I am the truth. He was absolutely honest and faithful in all his words and works. He did not show grace at the expense of truth. And although he loved sinners, he did not love their sins. As Yeshua said to the woman caught in adultery, who is it that condemns you? And she said, no one, sir. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Stop doing it. 
If this is the desire of our hearts, your heart, my heart, I believe with all my heart that the good Lord will empower us through the Holy Spirit to see to it that it comes to fruition. I am absolutely sure, guys, of this one thing, that the one who began a good work among us will keep it growing until it is completed on the day Yeshua returns. Hallelujah and amen. Now, um, tomorrow is a special day, and I'm sure um, you're going to be with family and, um, and friends, maybe. Um, not everybody gets dealt a great mom, you know. Maybe it was circumstantial. Maybe their mom... And I don't want to bring up a sore subject for some of you. I hate to talk about certain things because I know there's at least one person here who's thinking, my mom was a raging maniac and she caused me a lot of pain. And for that, I am very, very sorry. But the good news is when you come to realize the truth, you can break the curse. You don't have to perpetrate it any longer. You could be a channel of blessing. Um, maybe some of you are estranged from your kids um, for that, I'm sorry, it's painful. Um, but it is, it is Mother's Day tomorrow, something that, you know, we celebrate in America, something that we celebrate all over the world. I think it's nice to honor your mother all the time, but obviously you can't do it like incredibly well all the time, right? So you have this one day. So if you guys would come in with those flowers, um, if there's mothers here, uh, can I ask you to please stand up so that on behalf of the good Lord, we can hand you a rose. Um, if I'm going to be busy tomorrow and then Monday, I have to go out of town. If, um, if you're, if you're alone tomorrow, um, call the office this week and um, I'd like to take you out to lunch even if it's a few of you and just to spend some time with you and uh, to try to be a blessing to you so uh, feel free to do that on Monday you can call and we'll, I'll make sure to get together with you um Look, it's not easy being a mom. You know, my job was to, to teach the kids the Bible, basically, and, and take them out for runs and fitness because they were homeschooled. And I tried to be there for them emotionally, but, you know, Bernadette was incredible, as most of you are. Um, you don't have your mother for a long time. And Ecclesiastes says the dead hears, hear nothing. You can't tell them once they're gone. I'm, I'm telling you, it's too late. They're gone. They can't hear you. I know we say, oh, she's looking down. Not without eyes, she's not. Her eyes are in the ground. So while she's alive, bless her. I miss my mom. What, what year did my mom pass away, Bernie? We celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. This is 2014. Wow. Listen to how nuts I am. I have yet to look at a picture of her. I think I saw one picture and it killed me. Ten years. And I have yet to totally come to grips that she's gone. And to this day, when something really works out well, I, I actually go to call her. I grab my phone and I realize, I can't. I can't. Don't. Just, man, be a lover. The greatest act of love is forgiveness. Whatever it is, forgive and, and move on, man. It doesn't, you harbor that and it's just, it's just destructive. It just destroys you. Don't, don't let the enemy win. Don't. So I hope you guys have a great Mother's Day tomorrow. 
I hope you have a lot of fun. I hope you feel blessed, incredibly respected. And to the mother of all mothers, Then now. Um, the baptisms, if you, I'm sure you were told already, but it's at about three o'clock. That will give Tommy plenty of time to go home and heat the pool. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarechach Adonai v'yishmerecha Yo'er Adonai p'onav elecha v'hunecha Yisa Adonai p'onav elecha the assembly shalom. Shabbat shalom. Love you guys.